From Kalinago stronghold to the republic for which it stands, Dominica, located in the Eastern Caribbean, has had an interesting political history. Today, we will be discussing that political history, infusing themes of resistance from colonialism, resilience after tropical storms or hurricanes, and the successes or failures of Dominica's past and current Prime Minister in shaping the Dominican economy. This journey of Dominica's political history will be showcased in three sections. And this video is separated into chapters so you can go to whichever section suits what you, what you want to see or you're most interested in. So firstly, we'll be talking about Kalinago rule of Dominica. Then we'll speak about French slash British colonialism. Then we'll speak about Dominica's independence from Premier Patrick John to the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. Now a disclaimer. Hi there, my name is Almira Lewis and you're watching Almira Lewis Moments in Time. I am not a historian, I am just a young Dominican who loves history and would love to share Dominica's history with other young people in an accessible manner. And not just other young Dominicans, but other people from the Caribbean or just anyone interested in history in general and what that looks like, right? Also, another disclaimer is that I will be using my notes. And so if you have seen me glance over, um, or if you see me use my glasses at any point, I'm just using my PowerPoint notes. Thirdly, for sources that have a Eurocentric or a very European-centered or white supremacy-centered perspective, in particular when I'm talking about the Kalinago people, um, or just referencing colonialism within Dominica, please take what those sources say with a grain of salt. With all of that being said, Anukuma say, let's begin our journey. Before I begin this segment of my video, I want to make note of two things. Firstly, the Kar people will be referred to as Kalinago. As a matter of fact, French missionary Raymond Breton, when he visited Dominica in 1642, stated that the Caribs referred to themselves as Kalinago, referring to men, and Kaliponan, referring to women. Also, there will be no reference to cannibalism in this video as that is a false claim made by Western settlers to kind of categorize the Kalinago people as savages. With that being said, let's hop into our video. So, the Amerindian people migrated to the Caribbean from South America. Some of my sources say they came from Guyana. Those Amerindian people were the, and excuse my pronunciation, the Sibone, the Taino, aka Arawaks, and the Kalinago people. The Sibone arrived in the Caribbean at about 300 BC, followed by the Taino, which is their ethnic relative, about 500 years later, and who by 650 AD began migrating northwards through the islands, establishing larger communities within the Greater Antilles. Moreover, Amerindians lived in Dominica for about 1,500 years before Columbus saw the island on November 3rd, 1493. Arawaks lived in Dominica and then came the Kalinago people who again migrated from South America. As a matter of fact and contrary to what the Eurocentric sources that I will identify have said, Kalinago people were still arriving in Dominica at the time of Columbus's landfall. They were also in the process of establishing control over territory and communities occupied by the Taino people in the Lesser and Greater Antilles. However, contrary to what I've just said, one Eurocentric source stated that when Columbus arrived in Dominica, pre-Columbian populations were sparse due to several factors. One of these factors is the ruggedness of Dominica's terrain. It is said that the Kalinago people preferred locating their villages near a river on the coast of an island with gardens in the forest. However, this would have been challenging to achieve in Dominica due again to the ruggedness of our coastal terrain. Nonetheless, contrary to what this source says, the Kalinago people remained a constant force against Western colonization while successfully 
creating partnerships when necessary. Also, the Kalinago people were very economically savvy, often bartering their fruit, tobacco, and processed cassava bread in exchange for European goods. The Spanish were the first to attempt colonizing Dominica under the guise of converting the savage Kalinago people to Catholics. But their attempts failed miserably against the Talinago people who would raid or plunder their plantations, even on other islands beside Dominica, while successfully attacking Spanish ships. Then came the English, Dutch, and French from about 1560. However, in comparison to the Spanish, the Kalinago people were seemingly nicer to other Europeans, according to Sir Francis Drake. In his journal, Sir Francis Drake states, and I quote, From hence, putting over to the West Indies, we were not many days at sea, but there began amongst our people some mortality, as in few days there were dead above two or three hundred men. And the island of Dominica, the same being inhabited with savage people who do admit little conversation with the Spaniards, acted very kindly with us for those few hours of time which we spent with them, helping our folks to fill and carry on their bare shoulders fresh water from the river to our ship's boats and fetching from their houses great store of tobacco and also a kind of bread which they fed on called casado. From this quote, you can see the perspective of Western colonizers towards the Kalinago people. Even though Western colonizers were claiming and settling on Kalinago land, they still had the audacity, the audacity was high, to call the Kalinago people savages who sometimes did good. Nonetheless, attempts at colonizing Dominica did not stop with the unsuccessfulness of the Spanish. During the 1600s, French and English settlers took control of neighboring islands, leading to violent reactions from the Kalinagos of Dominica. In response, a crusade was waged against the Kalinagos. Furthermore, Kalinago refugees fleeing colonization on other islands also joined forces with Dominican Kalinagos. As a result, in 1674, British and French troops slaughtered the Kalinago people on the west side of Dominica, leading to the area being called Massac. The Kalinago people had attacked many European settlers on different Caribbean islands before the massacre occurred as the Europeans were settling on the land which Kalinago used for farming and gathering food. The Kalinago's fate was grim as the Europeans would always counter attack. The massacre in Massac wasn't the only one which occurred in Dominica. The Europeans saw the Kalinagos as warlike cannibals and wanted to drive them away from the island. However, Lord Francis Willoughby wanted a less violent approach to what he called the Carib issue and maintained contact with the Kalinago chief Indian Warner. However, after the Kalinagos attacked Antigua, Sir William Stapleton saw this as a good enough reason to slaughter all Kalinagos. Anyway, after all, you're only strong. Anyways, in the end, however, the campaign against the Kalinago was still unable to completely defeat or eradicate them because of their familiarity with Dominica's terrain. Moreover, the Kalinago people would not go down without a fight, as they should. We will, we will rock you. Mm. In 1660, the French and British agreed that Dominica and St. Vincent should be left in the hands of the Kalinago people. The hope was that the Kalinagos from other islands would also settle in Dominica or St. Vincent's. 
Despite this agreement, French settlers continued to move to Dominica and coexist with the Kalinago people. The neutrality be between the French and the British was sanctioned by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle. I hope my pronunciation wasn't. Anyways, however, neither party upheld this commitment. It is impossible to really like pinpoint the precise number of um, exchanges that occurred between the French and the British for Dominica um, during the 17th century. However, um, I tried to like break it down as best as I possibly could. So after being taken over by the British in 1759, um, it was Dominica was acknowledged as an English territory by the Peace of Paris in 17 from 1763. Initially governed um, as part of the Leeward Islands under British rule, um, it then became its own colony in 1771. Then in 1778, it was taken over by the French and then given back to the British in 1784. The French then made its last ditch efforts to capture the island in 1795 and 1805 and then after that Dominica returned onto into British rule. Let's look at life under French and British rule. Looking at the period from 1778 to 1784 beginning with French rule. During the period of French occupation the island or life on the island was pretty difficult for everyone involved due to various devastating storms, low agricultural prices, and numerous raids by Maroons. The British minority was also very critical of the French government's equal treatment or supposed equal treatment of free colored Dominicans. When the British ruled, things didn't really improve either. Um, Dominica was still plagued by hurricanes, maroon raids, and the constant fear of French reinvasion. In one instance, which is so funny, Rousseau was burned to the ground and local French residents pretended to assist British troops in the fort, but instead they spiked the cannons to aid an invasion that was coming from Martinique. <laughs> That's funny, just thinking about it. But during the 18th century, the sugar industry caused a significant shift in the racial makeup of many Caribbean islands, including Dominica. The European to African ratio changed from 1 to 3 to 1 to 12 in some islands, whereas in Dominica it was 1 European to 27 Africans. Despite, however, importing nearly 20,000 Africans between 1767 and 1773, Dominica's topography prevented it from becoming a sugar island like its neighbors. Nonetheless, after the American Revolution, Dominicans briefly enjoyed economic prosperity through trading with the United States. Sadly, however, the War of 1812 and subsequent hurricanes devastated the island's economy. And one thing about Dominica, we're going to have a hurricane. This led to exorbitant prices and scarce money um, by 1817. With the high cost of feeding slaves, some owners were relieved to be unburdened by emancipation before 1833. Also happening around this time in Dominica was the transition from Dominica being a leeward island to a windward island. Dominica, as stated earlier, was a separate colony from about 1771 to 1883, when it was administratively returned to the leeward islands. It stayed in this administrative group until about 1940, when it was then moved to the windward islands. Dominica then became a member of the West Indies Federation in 1958. Following the dissolution of the West Indies Federation in 1962, talks for other potential new federations were held. 
that the passage of the West Indies Act of 1967 by the British government, which granted Dominica the status of affiliation with the United Kingdom, those disputes or conversations were pretty much dissolved. However, Dominica gained complete self-governance under the 1964 constitution. Then, in 1970, Patrick John won an election and began serving under Premier Edward Oliver Libla. John later became the leader of the Dominica Labour Party after Libla resigned. The Labour Party-led government under Libla resulted in a better educated society with a civil service heavy middle class. However, such society's salary expectations began to exceed the government's budget. This led to black power radicals gathering under what was called the Movement for a New Dominica and the Civil Service Association becoming a relentless opponent of the Labour government. In addition, the Dominica economy of that era was dominated by foreign-owned banks, British, the British firm GIST monopolizing the banana industry, cable and wireless in telecommunications, and Elrose and Company in the, in the lime industry. Local ownership of businesses was not within the government control. As a result, the Labour Party government focused on land reform, institution building, and a buy local campaign to seek a socialist path. And I want you to remember this by local campaign because it's also going to come up again under the Roosevelt Skerritt administration. Let's hop back into Patrick John. Furthermore, as dreadlock wearing youth were blamed for attacks on Taurus and were accused of being linked to black power radicals, the government responded with force and passed the prohibited and undesirable Societies Act which made it legal to take the life of any dread found in a residence, allowed the arrest of any dread without a warrant, and denied bail to anyone with dreadlocks. According to Patrick John, the Dread Act, or what we call the, the Act to make provision for the suppression of societies established for unlawful purposes, and for the better preservation of public safety and public order and public morality, the Prohibited and Unlawful Societies Act of 1974, which is Act Number 32 of 1974, there is no mention of dreadlocks in this act. What this act does, it says that um, in section in section five, it says. Any member of an unlawful association who appears in public or elsewhere wearing any uniform, badge, or mode of dress or other distinguishing mark or feature or manner wearing their hair shall be guilty of an offense and shall be arrested without warrant by any member of the police force. When the act passed through committee stage in parliament, it was, um, it was Eugenia Charles who was the third nominated member of the opposition, the Freedom Party. Uh, she raised the point that in the schedule they mentioned dreads, but what was not put into the schedule was how do you define dreads? That dread acting. What, what was happening? No, they thought the rasters were killing people. Yes. Like mm -hmm. So then how? So they found it wasn't them or they just start killing people. Mm -hmm. Now the dread act come because I think they are killing uh, Ted Honey Church. Ted Honey Church? Mm -hmm. Which is Gandalf Honey Church father. Mm -hmm. And then there's why the dread dread. And then that's some guy called Choco Song. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of things. And then the dread now is to stay in the room. But if they are supposed to be in the city, they are in the next group. No closing. Okay. So that's why he passed the dreadlocks up. Anybody see locks, so she should took it. No, like you did, I was walking in the road. Hmm. Mm. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh my god, Alma, that should be on, on, on TV. What? Because the purpose of that ticket, and she's talking about it. 
Ci siamo ricevuti i parenti Woods. Ciao. Ma non ci fai due schifi. Yes. Io sono stato con il GIA Woods. Un TV. Ok. Un TV GIA. Io sono il Russian Watch. Io sono il TV. Io sono il Russian Watch. Io sono il TV. Io sono il Russian Watch. Io sono il TV. Io sono il Russian Watch. Io Wow. Wow, that's crazy. So we are the video and I just want to send uh, my heart out to anyone who was impacted by the Dread Act. Whether or not you agreed with the act, it is a part of Dominica's history. And as someone who currently has locks or dreads now, I can only imagine what it was like to be discriminated against because of my hair type or hair texture. That is something that is very real, um, particularly as someone who lives in the United States. And so my heart really goes out to the Rastafarian community who was greatly impacted by this act. The government's anti-dread campaign resulted in many innocent youth being brutalized, causing resentment against the Labour Party government led by Patrick Roland John. Despite this, John's administration made significant progress, including founding Dominica's National Commercial and Development Bank, eradicating shanty dwellings, and opening a new deep water harbour. John successfully led Dominica to independence from Britain on November 3rd, 1978. Uh, Dominica is a very small country with limited resources. We believe that after independence, it is imperative on our nation to utilize the human resources that we've got and also our natural resources. We are going to concentrate on harnessing our water resources our, our timber, timber industry, industry and, and the diversification of our agricultural, agricultural potential. Despite his mistrust of the political left, he included competent Dominicans without regard for party allegiance when trying to determine how Dominica was going to gain its independence. However, his attempts to quell opposition to his rule resulted in a clash outside of parliament in 1978, which led to the resignation of several cabinet members. Nonetheless, in 1980 or in the 1980 election, daughter of Bujorji parents and lawyer, as well as head of the Dominica Freedom Party, Dame Mary Eugenia Charles won that election and became Dominica's first female Prime Minister. Also happening in 1978 was the introduction of the Carib Reserve Act, which basically introduced the Kalinago Territory as well as the Carib Reserve Council. And this is what the Act states. It states that the ad, there will be the administration of an area of Dominica set apart under the act as a reserve and known as the Carib Reserve. Now it's known as the Kalinago Reserve. The Carib Reserve Council shall be constituted as a body corporate and shall be a local government body with the same powers as a village council. The council may make bylaws for the administration of the area, including such matters as drainage and sewage, pollution control, and the keeping of animals and sale of food. The authority may also protect the land of the reserve, establish public pangs and allot land for purposes for agricultural development. So the Patrick John administration um, was from 1970 to 1979. And then again, he lost the election in 1980 to Dame Mary Eugenia Charles. Now, in speaking about Dame Mary Eugenia Charles, her administration led Dominica for two terms. Her first term was from 1980 to 1985, and her second term was from 1985 to about 1990 or 1995. Now, let's really talk about Dame Mary Eugenia Charles and I must say that as a woman 
it is very exciting for me to speak about Dominica's first and only female prime minister. Now, Dame Mary Eugenia Charles, the first Dominican woman to become a lawyer, as well as the first and only female prime minister that Dominica has had, came from a humble background from the fishing village of Point Michel. Her father's success as a landowner propelled her into the conservative colored bourgeoisie. After studying in Toronto and London, she returned to Dominica and established a successful law chamber specializing in property law. In the 1960s, she entered politics to counter the ruling party's oppressive plans, eventually forming the Dominica Freedom Party. Charles faced personal attacks with dignity and used her legal training to challenge the government. Notably, she drew attention to the government's absurdities by attending parliament in a bathing costume during debates in order to oppose a dress code act. She was elected to the House of Assembly in 1970 and served when Dominica gained independence from Britain in 1978. Eugenia was also a strong advocate for the freedom of press, countering the Shut Your Mouth Bill, a bill that was made to silence criticism and outlaw the opposition. Although she would later be described as an ideologically conservative individual, right of the centre politician who was unafraid to publicize her conservative views in an era when it was more fashionable or unprofitable to articulate a progressive political ideology. Now, when Dame Eugenia Charles came into power, the Honorable Patrick John was not pleased. When Charles won, Patrick John, um, with the assistance of members from the Ku Klux Klan and the Dominica Defense Force created what is now called Operation Red Dog. New Orleans television station WVUE shot footage of 10 people arrested in that city last week. All of them were heavily armed and apparently planned to leave this country soon on an invasion of the Dominican Republic. It is still not known who was behind the attempted coup. But federal agents say there was someone chosen to head the country's government if the invasion was successful. Along with the men arrested, agents seized a large quantity of arms, ammunition, and explosives. In looking at the footage of the men who were arrested, I tried to see if any of them matched with men I had seen in the Ku Klux Klan Special Forces training camp story that we did last year. So what is Operation Red Dog? Well, Operation Red Dog was the cover name for a military filibustering plot that took place on April 27, 1981, involving Canadian and American citizens who were primarily connected to the KKK and white supremacist organizations. The plotters intended to overthrow Dominica's government, which would be the Charles administration, in order to reinstate former Prime Minister Patrick John. American white supremacist Don Black, German-Canadian neo-Nazi Wolfgang Dreoj, or Dreoj, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, so I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly, American Klansman Mike Perdue, and Barbadian weapon smuggler Sidney Burnett Allen were among the main figures in Operation Red Dog. The news media called the operation Bayou of Pigs, such a funny name, because U.S. federal official, officials in New Orleans, Louisiana, foiled it, alluding to the unsuccessful 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion that occurred. Aftermath of the coup, however, resulted in a riot because the coup was very unsuccessful. And so the aftermath of that resulted in a riot and killing in the 1981 carnival and a Dominica Defense Force assault on police headquarters that left one policeman dead and several others injured. However, a police sentry prevented the release of imprisoned Patrick John and Captain Malcolm Reed, potentially saving John's life from summary execution by local security forces. Later on, Eugenia Charles would pardon Mr. John, who would go on to lead the Dominica Football Association and build its headquarters. 
Now, before we fully dive into Eugenia Charles, I must mention that Hurricane David occurred in August of 1979. On August 29th, Dominica and its capital, Roseau, suffered a devastating blow from winds reaching 150 miles per hour. The island's economy, as a result, was greatly affected as the banana and citrus crops were wiped out. Sadly, 37 people lost their lives and 60,000 individuals were left homeless. This was the most severe storm to hit the island to date. And then we had Maria years later, but we'll get to that. And destruction from Hurricane David was valued at about EC $1.2 billion. So this is just to frame the economy into which Dame Eugenia Charles entered um, as Dominica's prime minister. During Charles's leadership, Dominica maintained social welfare policies while reducing corruption amongst the government and unions. The late Caribbean proponent was highly respected for her advocacy of unity and forthright manner. Her effective lobbying efforts resulted in aid for Dominica's economy, leading to improved living standards and what was described as the best roads in the English-speaking Caribbean. The island also experienced a decrease in violent crime after the seeming destruction of the dreads, but tourism remained low due to other factors. The Dominican Rastafari were still outsiders prosecuted by the government, but their relationship with the Charles administration improved gradually. And so the island began to heal. Now we are in 1983 and while Dominica healed, Eugenia Charles came to the forefront internationally as chair of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, standing next to President Ronald Reagan in the White House, calling for U.S. intervention in Grenada. I present to you the chairman of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the Prime Minister of Dominica, Prime Minister Charles. I think we were all very horrified at the events which took place recently in Grenada. We, as part of the Organization of East Caribbean States, realizing that we are, of course, one region. We belong to each other, our kith and kin. We all have members of our state living in Grenada. We're very concerned that this event should take place again. It is true that um, we have managed to live with the regime since March 79, and we felt quite clearly, and we had good reason to believe, that the Bishop regime was seeing it our way and was on the way to have elections. And we think this is the reason why himself and his cabinet were destroyed. This invasion of Grenada is something other regional ministers thought of as a violation of the Caribbean space. Honorable Dame Mary Eugenia Charles may have supported the American invasion of Grenada in 1983 in reaction to the coup d'etat that she experienced. Even though the United Nations General Assembly voted 108 to 9 in support of a resolution condemning the intervention by the US, her uncommon and even controversial stance did not lessen her popularity within Dominica, where she gained the cherished name Mamo Charles. Her nickname, Iron Lady of the Caribbean, came about as a result of her tenacity and unwavering attitude. Nonetheless, although Eugenia Charles is described as the Iron Lady, and having helped Dominica's banana industry post Hurricane David, as Patrick John before her, her administration had its weaknesses. 
During her second decade in office, from 1985 to about 1990 or 1995, the leader's popularity diminished due to her arrogance and lack of concern for grassroots opinions. She prioritized development projects aligned with U.S. structural adjustment programs, which favored infrastructure over social welfare and employment opportunities. Furthermore, during her time in power, the former leader failed to address the class divisions and color-based discrimination on the island. She governed, as some would say, like a strict headmistress of an old-fashioned girl's school, prioritizing good manners, hard work, and religion over innovation, progress, and community. So, while some admired her, the poor and intellectuals were not among her supporters. One of her dissenters, Rosie Douglas, who often opposed the Freedom Party though, through his op-ed writings about revolution, would then go on to become Dominica's Prime Minister in 2000. Dominica, the island I was born, uh, the thing is, my life will always be threatened there because of the barbaric kind of laws, the, the almost medieval laws which have been passed in Dominica. In the 1990 elections, the Dominica Freedom Party narrowly won a majority over the Dominica United Workers Party and the Labour Party of Dominica left-wing coalition formed in 1985. The Dominica Freedom Party retained power until about 1995 when Charles retired from public life. In elections that year, 1995, the United Workers Party won a narrow victory and its leader, Edison James, formed a new government. Then, in September of 1995, Hurricane Lewis, another hurricane, and it even had the che or the hat to have my last name, Hurricane Lewis destroyed nearly all of the island's banana plantations. The crisis in the banana industry in the ensuing five years hurt the James administration's popularity. And in January 2000, the Dominica Labour Party would win 10 out of 21 seats in the House of Assembly, forming a coalition government with the Dominica Freedom Party, which won two seats. Now, let's briefly talk about bananas and the Dominica's economy at that time um, and the impact of Hurricane Lewis. Dominica's economic dependence on bananas made it, made it politically vulnerable both before and after its independence. Pound ...or less than $2 for a 35-pound bunch. He may have to tote them two miles through a rainforest before coming to a road where likely as not, he must pay someone else to truck them to market. Dominica is an associate state, soon to be independent from Britain. What she is in reality is a banana republic. The adoption of the commodity generated economic growth and spending power, but also left the country exposed. The protection of banana production from a free market by British government policies and EU banana policy further exacerbated the vulnerability. Despite this, Dominica and other banana producing Eastern Caribbean islands have never been able to compete in a global free market. In the 1990s, Dominica's economy suffered due to the declining banana production and exports. The lack of investment in infrastructure limited manufacturing to only one firm producing soap and dental cream, and tourism development was hindered by the absence of white sandy beaches and an international airport. Now, my question here is, do you think Dominica's economy is still being hindered by the lack of white sandy beaches, beaches and the lack of an international airport? Let me know in the comments. Nonetheless, 
Hurricanes and tropical storms further damaged Dominica's agricultural sector, causing real GDP growth in 1999 to drop by 1.6%. As a result of the decline of the banana industry, James's administration led an ambitious economic diversification agenda. It enacted laws for the establishment of offshore companies. Furthermore, it aimed to let an Australian mining corporation carry out exploratory drilling on the island. However, that decision was later rescinded because of concerns that it would damage the island status as the nature isle of the caribbean the united workers government's decision to sell its stake in the island's sole electricity provider was also sharply criticized by the opposition the government's decision to provide sanctuary to saudi descendant mohammed al masari incited outrage among the opposition as well. James subsequently acknowledged that that decision was motivated by the prospect of receiving more British help. The information that Australian wanted man Christopher Scase had utilized the procedure or the Citizenship by Investment program to become an island citizen fueled even more outrage. The UWP administration attempted to construct an international airport in an attempt to attract more overnight guests to the island. But this too was also greeted with strong opposition since some believed that the nation would not be able to repay the debt that would have been needed to take on this kind of project. The government, however, purchased the requisite lands for the airport, but did not have time to physically begin the project. The James-led government was dogged by charges of corruption, and these allegations only increased as its term progressed. James's government did produce, however, some very significant achievements while it was in charge of running Dominica. There was a proliferation in the number of scholarships available for secondary and college education. There was some success in diversifying the island's monocrop agricultural sector away from bananas and towards other crops. It also increased public spending on capital projects, including roads, schools, and seawalls. These projects had a visible impact on the economy. This sort of economic program was, banded, was branded Tupatuism. <laughs> I like the sound of that name. Tupatuism. A Creole word meaning everywhere. However, the opposition argued that the growing economy was only being financed by constant debt. Do you think that's true? Let me know in the comments. Feeling confident with his government's achievements, James called a snap election six months before it was due in order to quell the allegations of corruption. Unfortunately, the Honorable Edison James lost the 2000s election to the Honorable Roosevelt Douglas, more commonly known specifically to Dominicans as Rosie Douglas. The new Prime Minister, Roosevelt Rosie Douglas, who died of a heart attack after eight months in office, was succeeded by the Honorable Pierre Charles, the Dominica Labour Party's deputy leader and a former cabinet minister. The coalition government under Rosie Douglas was formed in Dominica after the election between the Dominica Labour Party and the traditionally right-wing Dominica Freedom Party. Rosie Douglas, who was a prominent member of the Caribbean left in the 1970s and 1980s, led the government despite having been imprisoned in Canada for his involvement in a violent anti-racist protest. The coalition government 
won a total of 12 out of 21 seats in the Dominican Parliament. The new government struggled to set out coherent development strategies for Dominica amidst the structural decline of bananas. Despite his professed beliefs, Douglas aimed to build an enterprise culture and attract foreign investment. He traveled widely to achieve this goal. Douglas stated in 2002 that we live in a dynamic world and we as Dominicans have to open our eyes to the reality of the modern world. Adding the prescient warning that our history is important, but we cannot live in our history. Unfortunately, despite his vision for Dominica, he died on October 1st, 2000. And then the Honorable Pierre Charles took over. Pierre Charles, hailing from the community of Grand Bay, known for its rich cultural and revolutionary history, the situation is ripe for radicalism, and in a place called Grand Bay, the drums beat out a song against the CIA. Here, the most successful slave uprisings occurred. Inherited Dominica's long-brewing economic crisis, which saw the country's GDP stagnate in 2000 and then plummet by a staggering 4.2% in 2001 as banana production fell once more. Additionally, the country's fledgling offshore sector was weakened by its June 2000 inclusion on two lists of jurisdictions that leading Western nations were pressuring for tighter regulation. And what little tourism there was, was negatively impacted by the fallout from 9-11 in the United States. Since I spoke to you one year ago, on the anniversary of our country's independence, there have been seismic occurrences on the international landscape that have had a profound effect on the Commonwealth of Dominica. As the world proceeded precipitously into globalization, at that time, strong recessionary trends had begun to emerge in the world economy. In short, the G7 economies were all exhibiting stagnation. These reversionary trends have now become a recession propelled by the terrorist disaster which occurred on September 11 of this year. In 2002, Dominica faced a severe fiscal imbalance due to its narrow tax base and ambitious public investment program. The government introduced revenue raising measures like a stabilization levy and sales tax and expenditure reducing measures like capping capital spending. The IMF approved a standby credit of 3.28 million to help narrow the fiscal deficit and introduce structural reforms. The government had to further reduce the wage bill and announced a 5% pay cut for public servants in 2003. The Prime Minister acknowledged the difficult times and called for national support. He gained the confidence of international financial institutions and governments around the world. This resulted in concessionary financing and debt restructuring for Dominica, thus rescuing the country from financial crisis. Unfortunately, he died on January 6, 2004. After Peru's or Peter Charles' death, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt took over. At the time of his succession to Peter Charles, Roosevelt was 31 years old, making him one of the world's youngest government heads. Upon taking office, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt focused on positioning himself and the Dominica Labour Party for the upcoming election, which led to the termination of diplomatic relationships with Taiwan and the establishment of relations with China, 
who promised financial support for key infrastructure projects with clear electoral appeal. These projects included a new sports stadium, upgrades to the highway between Roseau and Portsmouth, improvements to the Princess Margaret Hospital, whose name has been changed to the Dominica Chinese Friendship Hospital, and the construction of a new secondary school near Roseau. Under his direction, Dominica expanded its global partnerships, entering the Bolivarian Alternative for the Americas, later named the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, in 2008, which was founded by Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, and also entering an economic union with five other organizations of the Eastern Caribbean states members in 2011. Dominican Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt gained new confidence in his re-election and shifted his government's focus to the development of the country beyond the Dominica banana industry. He aligned his government with IMF policies and prepared a growth and social protection strategy, which emphasizes four pillars, fiscal policy and administrative reform, enhancing the investment climate, sectoral strategies for growth and strategies for poverty reduction and social protection. The strategy was finalized in January 2007 and is a comprehensive overview of the country's economic opportunities and prospects. With regard to education, in 2006, Dominica developed a plan of action for localizing and achieving the Millennium Development Goals with support from the UNDP. The plan reported that universal primary and secondary education had to be at had been attained by 2006. Yet, dropouts were still high due to various factors, such as, and the biggest one for Dominica, migration. The Ministry of Education, as a result, aimed to improve the quality of primary education by providing training opportunities for teachers. And as a former teacher, we had a lot of trainings. <laughs> and standardizing early childhood education. The teaching of numeracy and literacy has also been improved. In 2010, the Commonwealth of Dominica conducted an evaluation of progress towards these Millennium Development Goals. And you can read the document and make your own, I guess, your own thoughts, um, come up with your own thoughts and feelings about the facts and figures that are stated in that document. In August of 2015, Tropical Storm Erica caused severe damage to Dominica. This was confirmed by Honorable Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt on Tuesday as he addressed the nation one month after the August 27 storm. Farmlands were also subject to high levels of leaching and soil erosion and the consequent reduction in soil fertility. Access roads, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to the challenge posed by the damage to primary roads, estimated at $624.7 million of tree crops, banana planting, root crop, and vegetable cultivation, severe. Losses to the crop sector are estimated at over $10 million. And as someone from Grand Bay who has family in um, the community of Pilitza Van, the damage was severe, and I tell you, it was bad. Tropical Storm Erica resulted in flooding, landslides, and destruction of buildings. Over two dozen people died, and Prime Minister Skerritt estimated a 20-year setback in the country's development. In September 2017, Hurricane Maria again hit Dominica, causing further widespread devastation as the strongest storm on record to make landfall, beating Hurricane David. The wind was savage. We lost the roof. It's been a horrible night, but my God, I can only feel the pain of those that don't have a house like that. 
I personally experienced Hurricane Maria and it was such a scary time in Dominica's history that I genuinely hope nobody oh my God, nobody ever has to go through a hurricane like that again because all I remember is the wind the wind sounded literally like my mom always says it sounded like the wind was talking flooding in our downstairs my mother told me to leave the upstairs and come downstairs if i had not listened the roof of upstairs left i would have died um like all of our windows broke downstairs was completely flooded my little sister and little brother was trembling my grandmother was praying Haley mary all night it was just a scary time and the next day dominica was like like everybody was like dominica is finished but oh, whew, this is a lot but one thing about my people we are resilient and we stand strong and we bounce back we have bounced back many times before and we will continue to bounce back if there's one thing a dominican is going to do is bounce back and that's on period and that, this is just me getting really emotional about it but continue to enjoy the video in response, the Climate Resilient Plan was created and the climate, resilient, the climate Resilience and Recovery Plan reflects three pillars, namely, one, climate resilient systems in Dominica, two, prudent disaster risk management systems, and three, effective disaster response and recovery. Despite these positives, as with many of the leaders before Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, the current Prime Minister also has dissenters for all areas for concern. For example, in November of 2022, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt called for snap elections. The snap elections were held in December and saw a historically low voter turnout of about 31.6 or 32 percent dominica's main opposition parties the united workers party and the dominica freedoms party boycotted the elections citing the government's failure to make progress on enacting promised electoral reforms the ruling dominica labor party controlled 19 out of 21 seats in the legislature after the december elections including six seats won in november because dominica labor party candidates had run uncontested independent candidates took the remaining two seats in july the caribbean court of justice and that was july of 2022 the caribbean court of justice dismissed a case that was brought in by the dominica labor party's opposition the united workers party that challenged the results of the 2019 general election. However, the CCJ, as the Caribbean Court of Justice is called, remarked that areas that there were areas for grave concern um, that remained about the conduct of those elections. And that is for you to judge. Do you agree or do you disagree? The Dominica Labour Party called the court's remarks gratuitous and criticized the CCJ's comments for causing unnecessary discord in Dominica. Not only have there been calls for electoral reform in Dominica, but many citizens have also questioned, as they did in the time of Edison James, citizenship by investment program within Dominica. Nonetheless, despite dissent by sex of the public, the Roosevelt Skerritt has been administration has been in power for about 20 years, making him the longest serving prime minister in Dominica's history. And so, in conclusion, Whitey Kubli once belonged to the Kalinago people who fiercely fought against European imperialism, using their understanding of Dominica's terrain to plan attacks and their economic savvy to barter when needed. In response, the colonizers fought back in efforts to quell Kalinago resistance. 
One of those genocidal efforts was the massacre that occurred in Massac. Then the island was temporarily left alone till the French and British began fighting for ownership. The Brits won ownership until the, the island's independence. From there, our leaders have climbed the steps of progress, having both successes and failures as lessons in that endeavor. And so be before you leave this video, I have a few questions that I would like you to answer in the comments. What part of Dominica's political history is most interesting to you? What did you learn from this video? What lessons can we gather from every single prime minister or even our colonial leaders in the past? How can our nation improve and has our nation improved? Please, again, let me know in the comments. And thank you so much for watching this video. Again, my name is Almira Lewis and you're watching Moments in Time. Ready, sir? Okay.